guests who couldn't attend this evening. So, okay, so that's going up online. And my name is Fran Gardner. I'm the parent mentor for uh, middle and high school families in Olentangy schools. I've been doing my job for about nine years now. Also joining on us on this um, meeting tonight is Ann Pistone. She is our new parent mentor for preschool and elementary families. So um, we're glad to have her on board here. Um, this is our first parent information um, series of the year. So welcome. We'd like you to silence your microphone if possible, mute yourself. Um, feel free to use the chat feature um, that's up under the three dots at the top of your screen. If you click under that, or no, I'm sorry, the chat feature is the bubble. Um, you click on that and th you'll be able to find the chat. You're welcome to turn your camera off or leave it on. It's totally up to you. Um, the chat will not show up in the recording. Um, and I will stop the recording for questions and answers um, at the end. But if you have a question during the presentation, you can either raise your hand um, by clicking the raise your hand feature at the top of the screen, or you can type it in the chat box. Um, so I just wanted to tell everybody a little bit about the Parent Mentor Program. We're here to help you in your special education journey. The Parent Mentor Program is a statewide program that Olin Tangy chooses to implement in our school district. We focus on promoting necessary and effective communication by providing information and support to families about special education issues and providing a mechanism to convey the family perspective back to our school staff and teachers. We are Olentangy parents who have a child with special needs and have experience navigating this special education journey. We want to help parents understand and obtain services for their child, and we want to help our schools understand the family perspective and foster good, good positive relationships and partnerships between home and school. Um, you're welcome to take notes, but all the uh, slides presented tonight and the recording will be posted on our website, um, hopefully by the end of the week, um, so you can access it there and any information. And you can always email Ann or myself if you have any questions um, going forward. So now that all that housekeeping's out of the way, I'm happy to introduce our presenter for the evening, Ms. Jennifer Rischolte. Hi, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Perfect. Perfect. All right, awesome. Can you see it, Fran? Perfect. Yes, so my name. Oh, wonderful. My name is Jen Ray Schulte, and I am the assistive technology specialist for Olin Tangi. So I've got my email. It's the traditional Olin Tangi email address. I do have a, a hard last name to spell. Um, lots of consonants in it. Um, you're happy to email me or you can always call my extension 4636. Um, a little bit about myself. I um, have been in the district, I believe this is my um, 13th year. And uh, previously I was 13 years in the Hamilton City School District, which is um, kind of halfway between Cincinnati and Dayton. So um, I am an occupational therapist, but then I also have my additional assistive technology practitioner licenses. So um, I live in Westerville with my husband and, and two teenage daughters and multiple, multiple pets. So um, we do stay busy. All right. So if you have questions, stop me or put it in the chat and then Fran will stop me. So today we're going to talk about really assistive technology and universal supports and what we have available in the district. Um, so what's assistive technology? It's really any piece of item, any equipment product that is used to functionally impact a student's educational performance. So if a, if a student who is served um, by an IEP is receiving assistive technology or a 504, it's got to be documented in either of those two um, 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 uh, documentation. So in an IEP, it would need to be in the profile, it could be part of a goal, and in section seven, it would definitely need to be there. Um, and a 504, it would just be listed as an accommodation. So assistive technology is something very specialized that we implement for a student served by a pupil services, um, as opposed to universal support. So universal support's kind of really evolved over the years um, um, as technology 
has progressed um, and just everything's built in more. Everything used to be much more specialized. So universal supports, I, I really think of as universal design for learning that anybody can benefit from its use. Um, so it's kind of like open source. You Anybody can use it. It doesn't need to be documented. Um, and again, we contrast that with assistive technology, which is really designed for a, a student and is documented for that student. So who can I contact if you think your child needs assistive technology? You need to start with pupil services, their intervention specialist. A lot of times maybe your question, the intervention specialist can help you with, or it's a tool she's used or she's implementing with other students. So really your IS is your, your primary um, mode of contact. If she or he feels like they need assistance, um, they would make a referral to uh, me and the two uh, speech therapists that work with me. And we divide those referrals up. Um, so the two speech pathologists who are um, Ann Farrell and Andrea Geider, they handle the communication um, referrals. So when students need alternate communication systems, you know, typically high tech, but those can be low tech too. Um, they will service those kids. And then I typically handle the reading, writing, and then like physical access type of accommodation. And we'll talk more about those in a bit. Um, the IS may want a full evaluation or they just might need an informal consult. It's kind of up to the, the educational team of what they're looking for um, by having this come out. So we're pretty flexible. We can just provide teacher training or we can do a whole student-centered evaluation. It just depends on what's needed in the circumstance. All right. So let's go on down to what AT does the district own. So we are lucky in Olin TNG that we do own a lot of equipment and a lot of technology. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is our lending library, which is pretty extensive. Um, we are very, very fortunate there that we have funds available and we've been successful in pursuing outside funding as well from, from organizations and, um, and yeah, stipends. So we have the Assistive Technology Lending Library, um, which is pretty vast. So I typically, if a, a, a intervention specialist or speech pathologist needs a piece of equipment, we own it here in the district and they can try it out. So we've got this tabbed at the top and you can see these are our large areas of equipment that we lend out. The first one being SGDs, which are speech generating devices. So those are all your talkers, um, communication systems. It could be a single button or we could be talking about communication apps. So it ranges the full spectrum um, of uh, speech generating devices. Um, the next tab is switches, and these are for students who need alternate access. You know, they're not able to use their hands in a typical way, or maybe they need to use head access or foot access. And that's where we look at finding other access points um, for them to interact with their environment. So in order to do that, we've got to take a switch through an interface, which is the next tab. And there's different interfaces. Um, there's computer interfaces, iPad interfaces. Um, let's see, uh, environmental interfaces um, and toy interfaces. So we, what we have to do with that interface is set it up and tell that end device what we want it to do. So if it's a computer, we need to say, all right, computer, when the switch does this, the, you know, what we really want the computer to do is hit the space bar or scan or whatever it is, how we set it up. Um, the next tab is our mounts. Um, and these are typically with communication systems, but they can be with switches as well. A lot of times we need to look at placement um, and maybe mounting them, um, maybe at the head level, maybe they need to be mounted on the table. Um, so we do take a look at a lot of that. Sometimes maybe it needs to be on the wheelchair um, so it can travel place to place. So lots of different options with that. And our last tab are accessible toys, and these are all switch accessible. And this is a pretty hefty tab for us and a pretty active spot in the library. And the typical person who checks these toys out um, is the speech pathologist, the occupational therapist, the preschool teacher, or the intervention specialist. And they will check them out for specific children. And items come in and out all year long. So um, yeah, that's pretty nifty. Next slide, we also support um, professionals throughout the district with visual supports. 
Um, this was our newsletter and our presentation from September, um, which was all about visual supports. Um, and really, um, this is more support on the teacher end on how to support children um, with pictures. I mean, whether they need um, a picture schedule or pictures for transitions, um, pictures for sensory, whatever it is, um, we try to guide teachers in finding resources and setting up a system that's going to work for them. Um, the primary program we use is Lesson Picks, um, which we do love. That took the place of Boardmaker. Um, so, yeah, great program. And we have many skilled teachers who are great at producing visual supports for students. Let's see, the next slide we have is an iPad. And we actually, in pupil services, I think we have about 350 iPads. And about 50 of those are um, what I call loaners. Um, and well, I should, I should back up. 50 of those are communication loaners. And then we have 20 additional loaners. So um, a speech pathologist or um, a preschool teacher or intervention specialist will contact us and want to set up a loan for a communication device. And typically it's the speech therapist um, and they'll request a specific app, whether it be um, Lamp Words for Life or Snapcore, one of those programs. And the student will do a trial in the classroom um, with the ultimate goal of us not providing a device for the students, but the students family obtaining a device so that they can use it in all environments, home and school and community. Um, but we like to be a step along the way and gathering that information and, and helping um, families make that in that decision making process. So uh, we could get contacted because somebody wants um, a iPad set up for a communication loan, but we could also be contacted because somebody wants um, an iPad maybe for a physical access loan. Maybe a student can't access physically a, a Chromebook or a computer in a traditional manner, so they might need more of a touch screen or maybe the login process is too difficult for them and an iPad eliminates that because once you're logged into those apps, you stay logged in. Um, maybe cognitively, they can't manipulate um, or operate a Chromebook. So we might set up an iPad loan for that student as well. Okay. Um, next piece of equipment um, is a C reader pen. And we do have a library of these as well. Um, these are we really target for students who um, struggle with reading. Um, they're a nice tools. Um, they have a targeted use. Um, what it is, it has like a mini computer inside and you scroll that little computer over a line of text and that pen does OCR internally, which is the optical character recognition. And it converts that image base into text and it reads it out loud to you. You know, there's um, pros and cons to using um, C pens. Um, you know, the pro is that if a teacher hands, you know, gives a student a handout and they can't read it, they have immediate access, you know, to um, to that read aloud. You know, a con is that, you know, it, it does. It's pretty time intensive. You have to, you know, scroll the pen across each line of text, wait and listen, scroll, wait and listen. So they do have targeted interventions. I think these really work best with handouts. I mean, these are not good for books or, or lengthy, you know, um, pieces that need to be read out loud. But for spur of the moment um, handouts, these can be very effective for students. Um, the next type of pen technology we have um, is called a LiveScribe pen. Um, and this is a similar pen technology, but different. This is more of a note-taking um, application and executive function application rather than a reading accommodation. Um, so how this works is, is that you have an electronic pen and you have pixelated paper and um, you write with the pen on the special paper. You can't use other paper and you turn your recording on and off while you're note taking. Um, and then when you tap that part of the note, you can hear what the teacher was saying when you are writing. So um, for some, some students, this can be very helpful. Um, that can allow them to um, write less and listen more and go back later and, and retrieve the audio. Um, for some students, this is difficult because it does take a lot of planning. When am I gonna turn the recording on? When am I gonna turn it off? and making sure that I take enough notes 
that I can find that piece of recording that I need later on, that I'm not just listening to a 40 minute recording again. Those notes can be uploaded online as well and organized that way. So again, that's called um, a live scribe pen. Um, and it does take quite a bit of executive function to implement. Jen, not to interrupt you, but my son, um, he's a senior in high school. Last huh? year, he tried a live scribe pen and you're, you, you're dead on with that. He just could not get around the, when do you turn it on? When do you, yeah, we found it, it wasn't helpful because of, because of that issue, but it's great premise for it. Um, so yeah. any tips for how to get a child to try it or use it or go out of their comfort zone? <laughs> So that's a really good question because I find it's a very specific student that likes this type of technology. So I feel like they have to be pretty tech savvy to begin with, and they definitely have to have an organizational system. Like this is the, this is my note taking system for every class, no matter what. Um, so yes, that there there is that. It's a very good point. That's why I say it's it's not one of our most um, popular. <laughs> Technology accommodations. I think parents would like it to be popular, um, but students just have a really difficult time with the implementation. So, perfect. Next, I'm going to talk about um, audiobooks, and we're going to talk about some federally funded audiobook programs. So, these are programs that um, are available to students with disabilities. So if a student is diagnosed with um, a print disability, which means they have um, a reading deficit that's documented someplace, um, if they have a um, physical deficit or uh, where they can't actually hold, manipulate, turn the pages of books, or if they have a vision deficit, um, they are eligible for these federal programs. And um, several years ago, there was a lawsuit and out of it came something called the Chafee Amendment. Um, which basically said people with disabilities do not have um, equal access to print materials. And what this did was allow for um, these nonprofits to provide um, file sharing or book sharing services where people could download or access it in their preferred medium. So, for example, Bookshare, you can download a Word file or you can download um, it in, in Braille ready text. So you can get on and, and, and pick your download format. Um, so, yeah, that was, was a pretty nifty. Um, Bookshare is the primary um, purveyor of um, resources. Um, it's currently free. I, gosh, I think this is like the 14th year in a row. It's been um, funded by the Office of Special Education. Um, I, I would guess this is going to continue on in the future. Um, Bookshare is widely recognized and used and, you know, um, in public schools and also in colleges, which we'll talk about. Um, so I think Bookshare's library is up over a million right now. And these are digital files, so they can really produce content pretty quickly because all they need to do is get that file from the um, publisher and then they can drop it in their database. And then basically on our end, what we're doing is downloading, downloading that digital file. And then for the majority of people, they would just be using a text reader, um, like read and write, what we're going to talk about in a bit, to listen to that digital file. So again, you have to be eligible um, for a Bookshare account. The nice thing about Bookshare is when a student goes to college, they can take this account with them. Um, and every college office of disability is familiar with how to use Bookshare and, uh, and to navigate it as well. So great resource. If a student um, needs a Bookshare account and they're eligible, their intervention specialist will go into the portal, into the uh, pupil services file and fill out the Bookshare request. And then I re um, um, create the account and send it to the teacher. Okay. There's a sister service, which is not free, called Learning Ally which is a really nice service too, but there's definitely pros and cons to it. Um, one, it is, it is we have to pay for it, it is not free. Um, but the nice thing about Learning Ally, it's more like a traditional audio website. So it's more like audible rather than, you know, listening to your phone read you a book. So it's got the professional narrators um, and then the interface is a little bit nicer. 
Um, the cons besides it being, you know, a, a pay for use site is that um, their library is quite small. And because these are professionally produced, um, their turnaround time um, to produce books is pretty lengthy. So if you need a book next week for class, Learning Ally cannot produce it for you, but Bookshare can probably get that for you. Um, we have several buildings that have a building subscription. And again, if a student's eligible, um, the building can create an account for them. I believe we're, uh, Berkshire Middle has a building license, um, Oak Creek, um, Johnny Cake, um, Walnut Creek. Um, yeah, I believe those are the buildings that currently have a, a building license. So again, a great place for younger kids to start, you know, um, listening to audiobooks is definitely a skill. Um, yeah, I found that out myself as I try to listen to podcasts and all of a sudden I don't know what happened in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> so it's a great uh, skill for students to learn early on. So that's Bookshare or, or Learning Out. Next, we're going to talk about some Chrome tools. So Chrome is the browser that we use here in the district um, and Chrome books are our browser. Um, if your student or your child is using a laptop at home, you, they definitely should be using the Chrome browser um, because the tools that we're going to talk about, you have to be using that um, Chrome to access them. And we're going to talk about some troubleshooting too. So this is a paid tool. Again, this is a pupil services tool. Um, it's called CoWriter Universal. Um, really powerful word prediction tool. It's been around for a long time. Um, it used to be on disk, you know, 30 years ago, and now we've gone to Chrome extensions. The nice thing about this being a Chrome extension is that um, it's not device driven. It's um, a point of access driven. So no matter what device a student logs in on, they have access to their tools. So, which is really great. It used to be that we would have to put software on a specific computer, and then that student could only use that computer to use their tools. So, um, it's just so much more of an open and inclusive, you know, platform the way things are now. So, CoWriter Universal, let me flip over to a document. So, it is an extension, so it's going to live up here in your browser bar. So when I launch it, I'm going to turn it on and you see you have an interactive um, word prediction over here. So you might not be able to hear this, but I can scroll um, over the word and reads it out loud. I can, you know, click on a word or I can choose the number and it's going to insert it for me. Um, this is great tool for kids who struggle with spelling because they get the immediate feedback of, oh, wait, I want to keep but it's cut so that was not the right word I need to go back um, the nice thing about this tool is that um, it learns a student's um, vocabulary and syntax um, the more a student uses it um, and it's very smart word prediction in that it, it knows okay a verb's next in the sentence so it's not going to predict nouns so very intuitive um, and just a great all-around tool for um, struggling spellers all right, the next one is a newer tool for us. It's the same company. This is called Word Bank Universal. And what this does is it, um, you tell this tool whether you wanted to do an internet search or whether you're going to, you know, search a specific article, but it creates an interactive word bank. So let's say a student, um, you know, has done the reading or listened to the article, but sits down to write the response and can't think of any of the vocabulary. So what this does is, is dredge your source. You tell it, you know, what to search and it pulls up um, Giraffe. the words that are interactive. And then the larger a word is, the more important it was in the sentence. And you can do sorting through these words. You can sort them by nouns or adjectives, by complexity and all, all of that good stuff. So if I click on it, it's going to insert it in my sentence. It's a pretty targeted tool, but I do like it in its simplicity. Do you have to qualify for WordBank? You do. These are all pupil services tools. So these would be students on IEPs or 504s. Um, typically, this is driven from their intervention specialist saying we need more support in the area of reading or writing. 
Okay. The next tool, and this is overlap with the universal tool, which is we're going to talk about in a minute, is read and write for Google Chrome. And there is a um, free version, um, and then there's a paid version. So we're going to talk about the paid version right now. So pretty powerful tool. Um, this has lots and lots of tools on there. Um, students don't typically use all of these tools. We would customize the toolbar for them. Um, what I really like about Read and Write is it's been around for a long time, just like um, CoWriter has. Um, but if you do talk to colleges, um, this is an accommodation they keep um, for students who can request it. So on demand, they can get a copy of not the extension, but the software download of it. And I, I haven't talked to a single college yet that didn't offer this as an accommodation. OK, so if I flip over to a document, I would find my little purple puzzle piece. And every student has this. Um, it's just a matter if they have the full version or the free version. All right. So here's my toolbar up here. The most powerful thing of this is are these three tools, the play, the pause, and the stop. And these are text readers. So these work in a document or they work in a website. OK, there's lots of other tools here in the, in the paid version. We have um, word prediction you know, uh, an additional uh, spell check, but that's just Google's. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, fact finders, we have um, visual screens for our in, uh, visually impaired students, highlighters, translator. So there's lots going on on this toolbar. So typically the first thing we would do is weed this out and pull off the tools that a student is not going to use. Because when you look at this, this is kind of overwhelming for most students. Okay. So that's um, read and write for Google. 99% of students are fine with the free version, which gives you the play, the pause, and the stop. Um, it's only really when students need to start manipulating image-based documents like PDFs that they would really need this full version to be able to do that. Okay. So again, that's available for pupil services students, the full version. Um, the teacher would request it through the pupil services folder. There's a form for them to do that. But all students have the free version as well. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about universal supports or supports that are available to all students. So first one is spelling and grammar. So first thing you would want to do on your child's account is make sure that their um, spelling and grammar is turned on. So if you go over to a document, you want to go over to your tools and then spelling and grammar and make sure all those are automatically checked. And this is what's going to give them the red and the blue underlines when they're typing is that automatic spell check. So um, Google spell check is pretty good. Grammar check um, is not the best, but we're going to talk about another tool that all students can add on to their account as well. Um, Google does have autocomplete, which is where, um, you know, you'll be typing a sentence and um, Google will, will kind of insert like three words in. Did you mean these three next? And if you hit tab, it inserts it. Um, it's very sporadic, so we can't really count on that. Um, it's, I'm not sure what triggers that algorithm. Um, but today I had a student who um, it auto generated for him and then the next student I work with, it did not work on the same topic. So um, inconsistent on that. The third is um, an extension called Grammarly, which is an extension I personally use on all of my own documents. Um, this is a great extension. Um, we offer all students the free version. So if I flip over to a document, you can see up here, it says beta, but that's a G for Grammarly underneath of there. So if you want your child to have that, you would go to the Chrome Web Store and you can just open a new tab and type in Chrome Web Store and Olentangy's is gonna pop up. This isn't the full Chrome Web Store. This is Olentangy's um, version of it. You know, uh, the Chrome Web Store is like, um, you know, the Apple Web Store, you know, you can find anything and there's lots of content in there that we can't regulate. So what we do is we have to get approved what we want in uh, in our web store so that they're they're all educationally relevant. No, no gaming in here anymore. So you would find um, Grammarly in the web store, click on it and just say add to Chrome and it's going to pop up up here. OK. 
So let me click over. The first time you launch Grammarly, you're going to have to set it up. And you would always want to see, you would say, go to my Grammarly, always sign in with Google. Um, and then that way it automatically pulls in your um, password, you know, your Google login and your password. Don't insert your own password in there because there's no way to reset that on our end. So Grammarly works in this, that a student would copy their document, open up a new Grammarly document, and then paste it right in there. And then you're going to go, Grammarly is going to make suggestions and you're going to accept them. You're going to copy it and then paste it back into your original source document. Really easy to use. Um, I talked about how this says beta here. So um, this is supposed to automatically work in a Google Doc, which it does inconsistently. So it's still in that beta mode, that test mode. On my laptop, it never works, um, but on Chromebooks, it sometimes works in Google Docs. But you know, when we look at kids going to college, we want them to be able to always be able to work it. So we wanna go in through that traditional way. So great, fantastic document. I think most teachers use it on their own um, IEP anywhere, on their emails, everything. So pretty powerful. All right. So there's a picture of Grammarly. This is another universal support um, that used to be pretty difficult for us to implement, which is speech to text. Um, we have Google voice typing now, which is fantastic and it's so accurate. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we would have to buy um, Dragon Naturally Speaking and install it on a specific computer. And then we would probably spend 100 hours training a student on how to use it, the commands, training for intelligibility and recognition. Um, and now it's straight out of the box. You turn it on and it recognizes um, most students' voices. So if you go over to a document, you would just click on tools, and then here is your voice typing. So you would click on it to activate it, click it off to turn it off. So pretty powerful and pretty accurate. This is a tool I like a lot. A um, Little bit harder to implement. It definitely takes some practice with it. Um, you know, we wanna make sure our kids use a really clear voice um, and that they're close to the screen. You know, I always tell kids, um, you know, to talk like they're a little bit mad so they enunciate their words a little bit more. We want to make sure there's not a lot of background noise uh, because that can interfere with the microphone. Um, kids do have to insert that final punctuation. So that period, that exclamation point, that um, question mark, um, they have to put that in. If they don't, it's going to be exceedingly difficult for them to edit that later on. I always tell kids, don't worry about your middle punctuation, your commas, your colons, your semicolons, you know, that can come later. Um, that's not a problem to edit in. And those are the things that Grammarly can pick up for kids as well. Um, and we really need to talk about, you know, the way we're going to use it. Are you going to use it for brainstorming where you're just going to get a bunch of ideas down? Um, are you going to use it, um, you know, let's say there's words you can't spell and you get hung up on that and it derails the whole writing process for you, just turn on your microphone and, and say, you know, caloric or onomatopoeia, you know, and just get it out of the way with it and, and continue on. So there's different strategies for that. And then, you know, finally, really kids need to have, you know, a plan next to them of um, whether it's a graphic organizer, a list pictures, something to keep them organized. Because when we speak about a subject, unless we have an outline, you know, we definitely tend to get off topic. So, and just keep in mind with speech to text, there is a heavier editing load. Um, it's easier to produce work, but again, you, there's more editing as when, you know, we talk, we're changing our verb tense, you know, um, we're changing what we're going to say, and all of a sudden things don't flow like we want them to. So a little bit higher editing load when it comes to speech to text, but great tool, one I use all the time with students. So um, back to speech to text, sorry, um, voice typing. This is a great one to use in conjunction with a text reader with that play button from Google Read and Write. You know, a student can dictate their work in, then use that play button. All right, is that what you meant, meant, meant to say, right? Does that sound right? All right, let's move on then. You know, so those two uh, tools really work in tandem with each other. They're a very nice complement. So read and write the free version we did talk about. 
Um, if you don't see that little purple puzzle piece up in your bar, um, first thing you wanna do is make sure it's pinned there. So if you look right next to URL is, this is called the browser bar. And there's this little black puzzle piece right here. I guess I should have made my mouse bigger for tonight. Um, little black puzzle piece, you're gonna click on that. And this manages your extensions. So these are all the extensions I have added on, but only some of them have a blue dot next to it, a blue dart, like a thumbtack next to it, which means it's pinned. So if you don't see Google Reader right up there, make sure that it's blue for being pinned on there. Okay, so that's 99% of the time. Um, when you're in Google Read and Write, let me click back over. And you have inaccessible tools. So on the free version, these are going to be grayed out. You would want to remove those. So you would come over here to your settings dots. And then options. And then you can see features. I can turn those off. So all of those grayed out features, I would want to turn off. And you can kind of see all of those are falling off of my bar. And I wouldn't want just leave the play, the pause, and the stop. Okay. Um, also in that settings, um, we can change the reading rate. So let me flip back over. And again, I'm going to click on my little settings dot options. And we have one called speech here. So mine's set at 40, which is a really good rate for editing. So that's like a slower read back. You know, if you're using your text reader to listen for errors in your work, you want it to be a little bit slower. But if you're listening for content, let's say you're using it on a website, you would maybe want 50 or maybe even 60 if you're an older student. Um, so you can, you know, really digest that material. So, you know, the way, your use of the text reader kind of um, um, influences or determines the speed you might want to use. Also, you know, how much a student uses audio. You know, for example, our um, blind students, we have, you know, digest audio information at such a quick level um, because, you know, they're so used to, you know, um, processing it. So it's really student dependent on, on how fast that readback should be. Okay. So again, we talked about the um, free version, which has the play, the pause, and the stop, which is really sufficient for most students. So let's talk about troubleshooting. If you're not seeing extension show up, the first thing you need to do is make sure the student is using their school account. So um, students will always say they're using their school account, but a lot of times it's their Gmail. Easiest way to check is to click on their picture up here in the corner and make sure it says at OLSD. If it says at OLSD, they're using their school account. If it says at Gmail, they're using a personal account. If they're using a personal account, not all of these tools are going to show up for them. Okay. So if the student is using a computer and not a Chromebook, we need to make sure the browser is synced. So number one, they have to be using Chrome. But number two, let's click on the picture again. See how this says sync is on? For some students, they haven't done that. So you would need to click that. And then it would say, do you want to link the data? And you would say yes. And then your extensions would appear. Okay. If the extension is not showing up, make sure it's pinned to the browser bar, which we talked about that. Our little black puzzle piece has our extensions, kind of our extension manager. And then if all else fails, restart. Um, I'm, I'm as guilty as anyone on this um, of not restarting my computer. And all of a sudden, it's been a month since I've restarted it. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be so difficult for students because as soon as they shut the lid of a Chromebook, it logs them out. Um, but on a computer, we definitely need to be logging out and logging in. Okay. All right. So let's talk about some iPhone tools. And I'm going to say iPhone because I feel like most students have an iPhone. And the tools I'm going to talk about are all available on an iPhone, whereas Androids, it's dependent on what kind of Android you have. So let's talk about some of these. So these are all ways for, well, you, you know, students use their phones all day long. That doesn't necessarily mean they use them for schoolwork. But here's some really pretty easy, easy ways for students to be using their phones functionally during the school day. Um, the first one's picture annotation. Um, I personally use this every day of my life now. So I take a screenshot of something 
or um, I take a picture of something and I circle it or I add text, I share it with somebody. So students can do this too in the school environment. You know, the teacher throws the assignment up on the board at the last minute and they don't have time to write it down. They can take a picture. Um, it, there's a diagram and um, they want to, they need to review it later. You know, they can take a picture and direct annotate it. Um, maybe the teacher has written um, the to-do list on the board, take a picture, text it to mom, you know, share, or this is what's due. Um, you know, that's a great way to open and communicate with students. You know, I, I do have two teenage daughters myself, so I know how difficult it is to log into Schoology and figure out what their to-do assignments are. So I love it when my kids share this with me. Um, it's just much easier for me to, to process. Um, so again, that's picture annotation and every kid knows how to do it. Um, the next one is scanning and OCRing, just like we talked about with that CPEN technology where it's taking that image and like converting it into what it thinks is the text. Um, that's what scanning and OCR apps do. So if you go on to, you know, iTunes, um, you can uh, Google free scan OCR um, and download. You take a, the student takes a picture of a worksheet. I'm going to say worksheet again with their phone. And then the phone processes that into the text and reads it back to the student. So, you know, I have had older students that we've used this more for life skills, you know. All right, you're at a restaurant. Let's do the menu, you know, listen to the menu and figure out what you want. Or maybe your employer has given you a to-do list and you can't read it. What are you going to do? You know, what's a strategy? How are you going to use your phone, you know, to have that read to you so you don't have to ask somebody to have that read to you? So lots of functional ways to use that, not only at school, but in the community. If a teacher has reminders, make sure to sign up, have your child sign up, you sign up. It's a really easy way to get text, you know, remind you at the last minute. Um, that, hey, that's due. So with my own kids, I make them use their alarms, you know, not only in the morning, but set your alarms for when you're going to do work. Um, you know, it just kind of gives them, you know, more of the responsibility for managing their work and takes it away from me, which as students get older, that's really what, what we want, want them to become more independent with that work management. So the next point is a calendar. And I don't get too hung up on electronic organization, um, as long as, as a student has some sort of organization, you know. I think we all probably have different organizational methods. Um, you just have to find a method that works for you. Um, I think I personally have an iCal that I share with my family, um, but when it comes to work, I have a big written planner that I turn a page and it gives me that, you know, temporal feedback. Okay, I turn a page and it's the next week. I turn four pages, it's the next month. Um, but that works for me. You know, whatever it is that works for your child, works for your child, they just need to have that um, system in place um, before, you know, if they're going to, uh, after high school, if they're going to do any kind of post-secondary training or education, that's pretty vital to them, that that's a routine set in place with them. Um, two more uses for iPhones. So uh, enable dictation. Um, so you can turn that on in the keyboard setting so that, you know, they can dictate in notes or they can dictate in a Google Doc, you know. And then similarly in the settings, you can turn on um, text-to-speech. And I believe that's under accessibility and speech. Um, you can either do sp um, speak select, which is where you highlight a section, or speak screen, where it's going to read the whole screen. And then you have a little panel at the top. So um, it, again, this is the... Um, the voice of your phone. So it's um, Siri reading the text to you. Um, so for some students, that does take a while to get used to. Um, but for some students, it can be a pretty powerful tool. Um, so all pretty basic ways of using an iPhone, but you know, using it more for educational than, um, than social. Okay. All right. So last slide is questions. Fran, are there any questions? There are not any questions in the chat right now. Did anybody okay. want to unmute their microphone and ask a question? No, I think I'm good. Uh, wonderful information uh, for sure. Oh. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Perfect. Thank you for attending.
I was looking at my iPhone while you were doing it to see if I could find where all the stuff was. <laughs> then my kids could probably tell me really easily, but I can't find it. <laughs> Easiest way, if you don't, if you can't find how to do something on your iPhone, Google how to turn on dictation. And the first thing that shows up is um, Apple support, and it's going to be a two-step direction. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. I'll and some that. of these are like common sense, but we don't think it that way. Um, like just setting up alarms for homework management. That's what my son gets into trouble mostly for. So, but uh, talking to him about this will help yeah. um, use it that way. So, perfect. My daughter, I like your thing of take a picture of it because she 